Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning uh, in the West and uh, good afternoon in the East. Uh, this is the uh, welcome to the uh, AI driven healthcare uh, secure Maddox and Juniper fast track workshop. Uh, we're uh, really excited uh, about today's session. We've got Matt Roberts on from uh, Juniper, who is the uh, uh, go to uh, expert for healthcare vertical. Uh, the agenda, as you can see, it's going to be pretty quick. Uh, do a quick intro. Uh, then I have Matt uh, basically take over for most of the agenda for most of the time, and then we'll try to finish up with a little Q and A. Uh, we are, uh, as you uh, hopefully know, uh, if you're a partner, or uh, we, uh, you know, uh, the, this is probably our 35th, I'd say, uh, fast track uh, session that we've done uh, over the last year and a half. Uh, we you know, it, these uh, have evolved over time and. Uh, we see them as providing, hopefully, education and value to the uh, to the channel, to our partners. Um, and uh, and again, we're going to focus today on, on on the healthcare vertical, which which obviously is very top of mind. Is going through a lot of disruption, a lot of changes, a lot of exciting things happening, and uh, how uh, Juniper Mist uh, can really uh, you know basically uh, uh, add value to that. Uh, you know, Matt's going to go into uh, basically an industry overview is going to go into uh, market opportunities uh looking at uh, highlighting some of the funding that's available uh and then you know ending up with uh, use cases and, and success stories uh as you can see there's we have handouts available uh for you know info sheets and uh, also uh, with some of the use cases we've talked about um anyway so now uh so secure Maddox, as you hopefully know we're a high touch uh uh, distributor, we uh, certainly, you know, we're, we're proud to have been uh, uh, recently uh, named the uh, distributor of the year in the U.S. for Juniper uh, for 2020. And uh, we, you know, we 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 very much think that we we're love 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 to uh, feel we we provide a high value of service uh, to to the channel to our partners, uh, and uh, we're we're based out of California. Uh, we have an entire team of uh, account reps, uh, solution engineers, a marketing staff, and uh, as well as uh, an OM team that I think is highly responsive and, and uh, uh, provides a, a number of services such as uh, deal registrations, uh, demo pools, POC, uh, POC uh, programs, um, and of course, fast tracks as you're seeing right here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just an overview of our team, some of the people I just, or some of the groups I just mentioned, uh, from marketing with Bailey, who's uh, the person really behind the, uh, who supports our fast track program, and Brooke, uh, as well as, uh, and Ruby, uh, as well as uh, our new GM, um, uh, Mike Federuso. Fader he sits in Austin. Uh, he's also the GM of uh, Cloud Harmonics, uh, and everything that they're doing there is uh, are things you're going to, see here in terms of innovation and providing service uh, and uh and then our, our se team of uh, anon keegan and uh, brian uh, and uh and then our armando who heads up our uh really uh, he's our director of operations next slide please so the sales team i can't say enough good things about uh you know in, in talking with our with our partners uh, time and time again, you know, we, we hear how much they love you know, Lisa Kiss, Nancy, Lisa Hansen, Kendall uh, Carson, and Lauren uh, Lauren Ferry. They're all excellent. They all is some some have uh, a number of years experience. Some have uh, you know let's say five to ten years experience. But overall, I think they really pride themselves on providing best in class service and support, uh, and in really helping our partners be successful. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm sorry. I, I, is, do we have, do we have a poll, Bailey? Yep, I'll go ahead and launch that now. Yeah, I think just before we start off, we just want to <laughs> ask: uh, Are you currently selling into the healthcare vertical? You know, basically, uh, if you could, we'd just love to know if if you're currently. Uh, uh, so you, your ch your choices are yes, you know, no, but interested, and uh, no, I'm not interested. I'm just curious about.
So you're all selling into healthcare. Excellent. That's great. Well, uh, that's great to know. And obviously, it's a good segue into, uh, again, uh, for Matt Roberts. Uh, Matt, if you could, please take it away. Absolutely. Thank you, Mitch. If everybody's selling, we don't even need this session, right? Uh, that's the good <laughs> No, it's really, it's really good to, to meet each of you. Um, I'm glad to hear that most of you are actually involved in healthcare activities. So my name is Matt Roberts. I'm the healthcare practice lead here at Juniper Networks. Been with the company for uh, roughly three years now, and I'm responsible for our healthcare vertical. We'll break that down just in a few minutes to tell you guys, you know, the way that we segment uh, the market. And so I think that'll be important for the discussion today. Uh, prior to joining Juniper, I actually spent six years at Brocade, uh, running our healthcare IP practice uh, across the world, actually, and it, it was a good experience. And uh, prior to Brocade, I spent 10 years at Cerner Corporation, uh, living in and outside of hospitals and clinics. So today, uh, at a very high level, as, as Mitch pointed out, I'm just going to be providing an update as it relates to Juniper Networks, uh, some of the trends we're seeing, and then also how our portfolio continues to evolve and really how we are changing the viewpoint of the network in these types of uh, healthcare environments. So, uh, Bailey, let's go ahead and proceed. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Juniper, some of you may maybe not. Let me just spend a few seconds here highlighting who we are and what we do. So $4.5 billion company focused strictly on networking and security solutions. Over 9,000 employees, 43 countries around the world. Uh, those of you that know and some of you may not know, cut our teeth in the service provider world, taking that same career grade mindset. So think high performance, high availability, we brought it over to the enterprise which includes several strategic verticals, healthcare being one of those, and, and it is a top three vertical for us. Uh, we continue to take market share and we continue to grow our customer footprint, which I'm excited about. Uh, in the spring of 2019, I need to uh, call out, we acquired a company called Mist Systems who specialized in Wi-Fi and artificial intelligence. It's now been deeply integrated into our switching routing security portfolio. Uh, we're seeing significant traction here uh, into many verticals, let alone healthcare. <clears throat> when you start to see like the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Walmarts, uh, starting to adopt your technologies, you know you're doing something right, and you know you're doing something really bleeding edge. Uh, I'll also call out, we've made a couple of uh, other additional acquisitions in Abstra, which specializes in automation and orchestration in the data center, uh, as well as a company called 128T Technologies, which now provides us really with a, re a really cool smart session SD-WAN solution. Uh, Tunnel-free architecture eliminates inefficiencies and those cost constraints of traditional WAN products. Uh, so we're talking now integrating a lot of new technology around deep level of visibility and insight into operations and overall application and user experience. So I'm going to point that out here. Uh, a few other things that you see on the slide, uh, Mitch pointed out some funding opportunities. So those of you that do want to sell into healthcare, I will point out one of the opportunities that some folks uh, may not realize that is out there. Uh, there's a program called the Healthcare Connect Fund serving the rural community providers. Uh, there's connected care pilots. Uh, there's telehealth initiatives that are going on as well. I could probably spend uh, an hour to two hours talking about those particular programs uh, specifically. If you do have interest and you do want to understand what Juniper is doing in some of these programs, please feel free to reach out uh, to either the Secure Maddox teams or myself directly and uh, we can fill you in on a lot of the good things that we have cooking. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Bailey. Um, I'd be remiss if uh, I probably not talk about this slide as we open up here. Uh, we realize that our customers and our prospects put a lot of stock, right, into the words of industry analysts, Gartner being one of them. If you look here, we have now been recognized as a leader in the wired and wireless land magic quadrant. That is a big deal. Uh, Gartner not only placed us in the leader quadrant, but they actually indicated we were the highest for execution you look back from the historical perspective in 2018, we were a niche player through, again, acquisition of MIST and deep level of integration work that's taken place. Uh, you were, you were seeing a major difference and a major, uh, you know, a major shift in a pole position for us in 2020 and beyond. So really cool things that we're doing. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the AI-driven healthcare and the AI-driven enterprise architectures here in just a second. Uh, Bailey, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so those of you, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, healthcare, very, very big industry. You may wonder what, uh, you know, and how we segment it. So if you look at it uh, this way, we've got a segment for providers. We've got another segment for payers and another segment for life sciences. Fairly self-explanatory providers, anybody that's treating a patient. So hospitals, clinics, long-term care, diagnostic you know, imaging centers, labs, uh, assisted living, et cetera. Payers, the insurance companies, commercial, right, uh, as well as governmental. Uh, life science can be pharma, biotech, biomed, med device, 
uh, clinical IT, that list goes on and on and on. There's over 6,000 providers uh, you know, from a hospital perspective. Uh, IDNs, if you start talking about integrated delivery networks, that number comes down a bit. Uh, you've got over 1,200 payers uh, with parent-children relationships here in the U.S., and roughly about 15,000 life science companies that now exist uh, from east to west coast. So a lot of life sciences that have been popping up. And again, the lines are blurring here as well when you start to look at trying to drive down the costs, try to increase better efficiencies and, and a whole assortment of different things, which we'll, which we'll address actually on the next slide. So Bailey, let's go, let's go there. Uh, if you look at uh, the healthcare industry uh, and you guys, uh, sell into it today, right? So I'm not going to beat this slide up too much, but we've seen an evolution of a triple aim move to a quadruple aim. So improving the health outcomes, improving the patient experience, the access to healthcare and costs, right? Those are really the four. The interesting piece here too is now you're dealing with clinician experience and clinician burnout. We're living in an era of COVID. We're hopefully emerging out of uh, COVID, right? Uh, it just depends on uh, maybe which country in the US. We have our own challenges here. Uh, what happens naturally with uh, you know the pandemic and a lot of things that we've seen where uh, you know, people were, were scrambling, right, to accommodate for not only the frontline workers who are treating patients who are coming in, but also a displacement or disbursement of staff going back into a remote setting, if you will. With all this, right, <clears throat> we understand there's a rapid amount of devices and applications that are being deployed in and outside of the hospital, right, on the provider environment. Infrastructure is going to continue to face challenges. There's a lot of band-aided networks that are in use today, and we start putting more of these sophisticated applications and a lot of these collaboration uh, solutions that are being deployed. So think telehealth and telemedicine, robotic surgeries. Uh, it only exposes network bottlenecks, right? And so there's a lot of hospitals that are out there today with outdated infrastructures. It's still a manual system of layers of switches and VLANs and security products. It makes upgrades costly. It makes operational workflows very, very complex on top of it. So with all that, right, you've got to make sure you've got the right information at the right time to a particular clinician, whether it be on-prem or whether it actually needs to be done virtually now in a virtual visit. And so having visibility into these types of experiences from a campus perspective, but also perhaps over distance is, is extremely important. Bear in mind, phishing, DOS attacks, ransomware, all these new cyber threats, right, that continue to emerge, they're not going away, not going away at all. And so we've got to continue to protect the network as we look at this holistically. And so, you know, there isn't one vendor who can do it all. It's really the epitome of a best of breed um, ecosystem. I use the analogy and I use the question oftentimes, how many locks do you have on your front door at home, right? I can assure that probably most of you have more than one. In fact, most of us probably have uh, at least two, uh, as well as an alarm system. We might have a ring, right, doorbell system or Arlo, or even, you know, maybe joking aside or not, a German shepherd behind the door. But my point is here is there's multiple ways that we've got to look at safeguarding the data, right, to keep this thing protected. Uh, to keep the reputation of our providers, uh, you know, it, it's, which is at stake um, in, in good standing, but then also to gain confidence in the patient population that we can trust our providers with our data. And so a lot of this stuff is going on. And again, it leans on the infrastructure. So Bailey, let's jump, uh, jump to the next slide. When we look at the, a recent CIO survey that was done in 2021, an uh, interesting thing that aligns with our vision, which we'll talk about in a second, is automation and tools like AI, right? And robotic process automation or RPA, they're coming to the forefront. Uh, cloud, right, continues to emerge as well. Digital workplace supporting home. There are so many different areas in which we do play, right? Being a networking provider and also having solutions that align very well to the needs or demands of what leadership is looking for within provider settings. I wanted to point this out because it's very, very clear. We're looking for ways to make things more efficient finally in the world of healthcare, right? And it may start or spawn out of the, the clinical side, but IT is a byproduct of this, right? And it's a service delivery mechanism. And so, as I point out, a lot of the hospitals are community service providers now. And so those models are changing and shifting to ensure that we're delivering an optimal experience at not only the patient side, right, but the clinician side. And IT, again, just a byproduct of it as well. So, Bailey, let's go to the next slide real quick. So our vision at Juniper is to extend our AI capabilities that exist today on the wired network, the wireless side, and security across the entire portfolio. Uh, that's the mission we're on, just to be uh, blatantly uh, clear here. Uh, telemetry data, it's where it starts. So at the bottom left there, we then feed that into our AI engine, 
okay, which then continues to learn and really boost its efficacy. It's now on its third generation of algorithms, which really what that means, everybody, is it helps proactively identify and resolve these issues across all different types of industries, right, and different segments, healthcare being one of them. And then our virtual assistant then takes those insights that we have been provided there and actually moves them into actions, okay? So if we go to the next uh, little click there, really, that's our Marvis virtual assistant, which we'll talk about here in just a second. So you translate those insights into actions, and then it gets to what I ultimately call, right, the state of nirvana, which we coined the self-driving network. So to be clear, we're looking at taking, and we are already taking, machine learning and the AI moving across the portfolio to make the infrastructure extremely intelligent. And to look at this is how does the network work for you opposed to you spending time in cycles, right? Trying to troubleshoot, trying to chase ghosts, all those fun things that typically plague IT. Go to the next slide, please. So insight, all right. Uh, maybe a, a relatively confusing statement, maybe not, right? Some, the, some of those you understand uh, you know, the, the Wi-Fi side. Uh, in my opinion, gone are the days of the general perception that honestly the network is good enough, right? And up is good enough. It's not actually the same as a good experience, especially when you look at healthcare. And this is where we literally are pioneering what we call as deep level insight around service levels, uh, then correlation, looking at switch health, uh, taking deep packet captures of 150 different machine states. And really even taking some of those things that plague medical campuses too, and uh, the annoying elements is looking at bad cables or misconfigured ports, right, that, that exist out there. And the more insight we can provide around the user or the device experience, the better. Uh, go ahead and click, Bailey, if you don't mind. And so how do we tie that together? Well, you look at assurance. We know that headless wired IoT devices, typically today, they can't call the help desk. Uh, they can't call IT when connection issues arise. So within our platforms, we actually set parameters or allow IT to set the parameters to proactively alert the team, let's say if an SLE drops below 80%. And so tying the wired and the wireless together, it brings a whole new level of assurance again to a hospital setting, right? Uh, and that again, extends over to manufacturing from let's say pharma over to med device, right? The uh, speed to market is everything. So you kind of think of it that way as well. And automation. So we hate that our teams have to continue chasing configuration issues, right? Uh, we know that that's the number one issue for downtime uh, and for human error being uh, actively involved in this, the less you touch the network, the better, right? I think we can all, all agree to that. Now, our belief fundamentally is that machines should help configure machines or be able to make those changes or at least recommend changes before taking an action. So that's an important part. You're hearing us build all of this in and uh, we'll continue to expand on that here shortly. But relevance, that might be the most important topic in health IT, uh, especially today. So how can we take a step back? We can look at technology and use technology to actually transform the experience for patients, for guests, for visitors, uh, for researchers, right, for uh, clinicians. We'll go, uh, we'll go into a few examples shortly and how we can actually take and leverage Bluetooth low energy and let's say IoT ports to elevate a safety profile for organizations, but also really uh, create a platform for really unique experiences based on Wi-Fi. Let's go to the next slide, Bailey. So transition, uh, it can be a terrifying word. So you guys, you guys sell into healthcare, right? Uh, it's a terrifying word. Um, in order to thrive though in this era, transitioning and in certain contexts, maybe I should use the word adapting. It's, uh, you know, it's a matter of success or failure. Uh, when you start to look at M&A world and you start to look at different areas of being more agile within the organization, um, I'm always I'm always an advocate for uh, coming up, sticking your head up and looking around at what are some of the newer technologies that are out there and looking at what is more fit for purpose for the organization opposed to just buying the same brand that you bought before. Now, you know, if they're buying Juniper Networks and they've been using Juniper for Networks for 10 years, I would not fault them for coming up, right? And taking a look around to seeing what other technologies are there. That's in the best interest of the organization, right? And so when we start to look at this status quo, right? And remaining status quo can be the, the, the enemy, you know, the worst enemy for the organization. And that's why really we focus on concentrating what I say is, you know, treating the cause and not the symptom as it relates to the network. And so an interesting observation that you'll you'll see here and you're probably already seeing is that the opportunity may not necessarily start with bits and bytes or the traditional packet passing. 
it actually starts focusing on the user experience. So think doctors, nurses, radiologists, researchers, many other folks that are, you know, that are in this particular setting. And so that's why we built AI into the network so that we can drive a more assured experience that results in one, productive users, right? Way more productive, which hopefully, you know, results in ultimately a better experience for patients, which also means far less IT support tickets for typically thin IT staff that exists within a hospital setting. Now, you don't see swarms and swarms of teams unless maybe there's a very large for-profit organization where they do have the staff, but most hospitals, people wear multiple hats, and they typically are, are running razor thin, right? And they also operate on razor thin margins of two to 3%. Now, uh, let's go to the next one. You throw in the virtual network assistant, which is, this is the industry's only one. We use NLP or natural language processing to actually get answers about what's happening on the network. You've now got the ability to speed up troubleshooting, right? And you can make decisions or you can make recommendations to get to that rapid state of resolution. So you're again, not chasing ghosts. You're not spending 80% of your time trying to troubleshoot a typical issue. And then next one, all of this is built on microservices, okay? So no longer are we asking organizations to install physical controllers and manage those devices. All of that is not only costly up front, which you probably realize with all the pieces and parts, um, but over time it's costly as well. And it's just not agile. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next slide here in a second. So um, the next one is digital engagement. So lastly, quite possible when we talked about being relevant, um, you know, this is very, very interesting. And the fact that our access points, uh, I like to call them Swiss army knives. And so they come with patented virtual Bluetooth, low energy technology in the array that allows these organizations to deploy and really move virtual beacons with the simple click of a mouse and a drag and a drop which eliminates the need for physical beacons in these environments. Um, we'll talk about this more shortly in some of the use cases that are emerging, but really what it comes down to is creating a, a consumerism or a patient engagement network where you can physically and digitally engage as soon as somebody walks in the door, maybe before they even walk in the door. Just some logos uh, that we have up here as well that have continued to make the transition over to, uh, to, to Juniper and Mist. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, as we mentioned on the last slide, when we talked about the microservices, uh, here's how we're keeping it really simple. You're going to see the traditional architectures uh, on the left, right, that tend to be the default today, more boxes, licenses, pieces and parts that I referred to a, a bit earlier. Then if you look to the right, you're going to see how we've architected all of this for our services to actually exist in the cloud. So you might be wondering, well, if connectivity to the MIST cloud is lost, will the AP function? Yes, it will. It continues to serve clients. All the data is uh, locally bridged. The information is cached up to a four hour period. And once cloud connectivity is reestablished or restored, the information is sent back. So think config data, think uh, telemetry data. And additionally, not only do you get those benefits, right, of the, uh, the, the milliseconds of being able to capture and know what's going on around this network, uh, do the deep level packet captures that are teed up, and we'll talk about this here uh, in a little bit, and that's happening on every network event. You can't get that with the architecture that's on the left. The other thing that you can get here with a more agile cloud-based architecture is we provide the software and future updates weekly behind the scenes with no disruption. So literally like Christmas every week where somebody can log back into the network and you can see uh, you know, what features and functions have been added as a, uh, as a rolling update, right? On a weekly basis. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, Marvis, okay, so harsh reality here in healthcare, and, and since everybody is, is uh, aware and everybody works in this environment, uh, is that the IT team, most notably the network team, uh, always assume guilty until proven innocent, right? That's probably a fairly generic statement that can be applied across different industries, but healthcare, it's super sensitive, right? Uh, finger pointing, I uh, call them cat and mouse games, right? They can render literally hours of the day useless, and again, when 80 percent of the time is spent identifying and locating the problem, you're already in reactive mode, right? So let's let's be real. And then you add on the fact that well, the healthcare, healthcare statistics tell us that 40% of like network teams say that, I believe the statistic was that it takes four hours to troubleshoot a typical issue. And you know, whether it's my wireless connection sucks or the EHR is frozen or a doctor or a clinician, a nurse, their hourglass is spinning constantly. 
it all comes back. What's up with the network? That's the network's fault, right? And all these issues are a, a time suck. They impact the overall healthcare experience, especially when you don't have the right tools at your disposal uh, that can actually help work for you, right? So now we've got the ability to take the insights like we talked about uh, when we talked about our vision, we talked about our mission, and you saw at the bottom there how we were feeding the data uh, basically from a telemetry standpoint across the data science toolkits into the virtual assistant. You now got the ability to have the assistant work for you. So we're not talking about, uh, you know, we're not talking about eliminating jobs here, right? We're talking about augmenting staff to make the staff more productive. And so how do you make that network work for you? Well, yeah, this is where Marvis can become the daily what I call is the cup of coffee view, right? Or the dashboard. So you can quickly walk in uh, right as you get there in the morning, or maybe it's at lunch, or maybe it's in the afternoon. And you can go to this dashboard and you can quickly identify any issues that might be taking place on the network today. And the beautiful part is Marvis will help provide recommendations uh, or even fixes to cut down on those trouble tickets that will typically come in, right? And so some of the things that Marvis can do is the bottom right. I'm not gonna uh, beat those up uh, too much. You guys can see those. Um, but at the end of the day, again, having the tools at your disposal to take the telemetry, take the insights and translate it and actually doing something with it proactively. That's what this is about. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So the other part to this too is that not only do we have the AI machine learning aspect, uh, virtual assistant, but we've actually taken, again, that whole, uh, that whole piece and we've carried it over into our EX switching line. So that's some exciting news. We've taken the same machine learning capabilities. We've now moved it over to our EX and our SRX product line. That's what we call wired assurance. So when you heard me say that term wired assurance earlier, this is what I'm referring to. And so it's really changing the game and the way that networks are deployed and managed when you think about it. And again, going back to some of those headless IoT devices or wired devices that you may not have any sort of idea uh, you know, whether they're functioning correctly or not. And so with zero touch provisioning and some of the easy template configurations that we provide to our, uh, to our cost customers, you're able to roll things out much faster on top of it, right? So not only deep level visibility and what's going on, but how do I provision much faster? How do I roll networks out much faster? And so we have SLEs, uh, that are very, very detailed, so you can get switch health, like we talked about, where the bad cables are, misconfigured ports. You've got the intelligence again working for you, opposed to having to dig into the network to identify the issues um, or the problems that may exist, or maybe even potential problems, right? Because it hasn't hit a catastrophic state yet. And so, you know, when you look at those headless wired devices, like security cameras and refrigerators and MRI machines or CT scanners, there's hundreds, right? If not thousands, depending upon the size of the organization, of connected devices that exist in these environments. And so they're not smart enough to call the help desk. And so this is where you can get deep level insight around these particular types of connections and utilization rates and a whole assortment of things to make sure they are actually functioning appropriately. Okay, let's go to the next slide real quick. The beautiful part here too, when we move to this uh, slide is that it's interoperable, okay? so. While you will get more information and you will get naturally uh, a deeper level of, of switch data uh, as it relates to combining MIST and Juniper holistically, uh, just because simply put, we can't get into some of our competitors' uh, switches and we can't extract as much data. However, we are interoperable in the fact that we can still get the items that you see bolded there. So uh, firmware compliance, AP Infinities, power compliance, inactive wired VLANs, uh, all these things can be still garnered and extracted out with utilizing, uh, you know, MIST, if you will, and looking at a wired assurance uh, software offering. So there are some benefits there. Again, you know, we're not saying you have to rip and replace. Uh, we're saying that if you have an existing infrastructure that is there today, that you can preserve that investment until possibly the next time that you are looking to upgrade the network, whether it's in life and a support, or you've got other, uh, you know, got other uh, specific project work that's going to require an uplift of the network. Point of the matter is, is interoperable, open, standards-based company. Uh, our mantra has not changed. It is not changing. We partner very well, and uh, you know, the, the the slide here kind of speaks to itself. Let's go to the next slide real quick. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, you know I think I've hammered home the point that experience matters. I think everybody probably gets that. Um, the interesting part is that the network uh, can play a strategic role now in patient engagement. 
which hospitals are building strategies around today, right? So most of you are probably seeing that. Um, imagine being able to use VBLE uh, as a virtual Bluetooth low energy to electronically greet a patient that's walking in the front door of the hospital with a push notification to their mobile device. And then as you greet them, or maybe give them COVID instructions or you know wh whatever that greeting might be, right? Um, then offer up uh, a bit of a dialogue or an assistant that says, hey, where are you trying to go today? And then offer up a turn-by-turn -turn navigation experience to their appointment location. And then as they navigate through the hallway, maybe they pass a coffee shop or a gift shop uh, based on proximity and knowing where people are using VBLE. And again, again, location-based services, you could offer them up a digital coupon for 20% off, right? So this is a reality. And so I call it the art of possible because there's so many different things you can do with location-based services today. Um, so not only are you cutting down on, on missed or late appointments with some of this in, uh, in building and indoor navigation and wayfinding, but you're really building a, you know, a consumerism platform for the patient population. And the really cool part is it's providing them with what they feel is a very individualized experience. Okay? And so we know, we know technology, right? When, when you look at these types of facilities, the plan is to digitize everything. I just see more and more location-based services, uh, you know, use cases emerging out of this particular venue, uh, as well as over into uh, the life science space as well, and some of the payer marks. We'll talk about that here in a second. Let's go go to the next slide real quick, and let's um, let's flip the script and look at it from a clinician's perspective. Uh, so at times, patient room utilization can be a nightmare. Right? It can be painful uh, to keep accurate, uh, as well as you know, look at look at bed management on top of it. Uh, what other what other resources though, right? Do do some of the staff members utilize in the clinician world or even in the administrative world? Uh, that, that possibly get books. So think about conference rooms. Think about consultation rooms. We've got the ability to help the staff navigate now and spend less time actually chasing down some of these available resources where perhaps they would be booked or being utilized and then having to go uh, scramble to figure out where 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 they need to go next for maybe a uh, you know telehealth visit or whatever that might be a consult. Now, what, what about also the time and the costs that are associated with locating uh, medical equipment, okay? So with, with uh, VBLE and location-based services, you now have the ability and, and staff has the ability to track critical medical assets, okay? So think wheelchairs, think pumps, ventilators, vacuums, uh, all within a one to three meter proximity. So RTLS systems, uh, they may be in place today for some of these purposes, but Kind of my point is, is that you might be able to cut out some of this overhead of another system or actually tether the network together through an open API. And we leverage SDKs where you can help improve workflows and you can help streamline operations as well. We even got into some discussions and conversations about specimen collection and processing workflows. Well, so, you know, what, what if you could manage and monitor the movement of these specimen collection bags between departments because there's time lags, there's massive delays that are associated by the time it's collected and by the time it's actually read. Uh, so again, re real things that are, that are happening where we can make uh, a major difference when you start looking at location. You know, one other quick note I'll point out on this slide is we know clinicians move around the campus, right? That's a no-brainer. And so one, one, you know, one day they might be on floor four. Uh, you know, if they're rounding, they'll be four, three, two, one. Uh, they might be crossing buildings, right? Depending upon how large the campus is. But it's important to look at the experience again um, that that is happening on the application side. And so we can set, we can monitor, customize service levels by individual. And it's all possible knowing who the user is tethered to a device, and again, based on a device. We separate, obviously, PHI uh, and all patient-related data. That, that's uh, not into a question here, um, and so it's you know it's obviously HIPAA compliant, and uh, you know we can help really intimately manage the clinician's network experience. It was interesting. We were having a conversation a couple of weeks back with UCLA Med. And uh, the, the lead architect for the network says, my CTO always has a really bad Wi-Fi experience and he beats me up all the time about it. And he kind of chuckled and he said, sir, you're saying that I can actually know where my CTO is and I can make sure that he's having a really good experience. And he said, that kind of sounds really self-serving in nature, but I have to keep my job. But, you know, hopefully if I can serve my CTO in a, a good experience, I can serve a clinician a good experience too. And so, you know, from an IT perspective, right, there's some, some realistic side of it to understanding and roaming and when connections are dropping and 
just the deep level of understanding based on behavior and a user's journey that we can provide through the dashboard that will allow you to fine tune that experience, right? Um, through a given day, a given week, given month, given year. So that's that's the really cool thing that we're doing here. Uh, but let's go to the next slide, please. And so what does that mean from like an IT side, right? Uh, and an IT operations, um, you know, so if we flip it back to IT, we've talked you know, about the biggest benefit that's almost seen immediately, and that's reducing support tickets. When you can cut down 80 to 90% of your Wi-Fi support tickets, you're automatically in a good position. Um, not sure you're like the guy that you see on the screen here, but uh, obviously he's in a good position. Um, and also, you know, when we have these deep packet captures, we've talked about that actually happen in real time and only can be done because of the microservices architecture. We're doing things in milliseconds and we're capturing those 150 different machine states. The IT staff is no longer chasing ghosts, right? And so imagine not having to go ask a doctor or a nurse to go recreate an issue and then recreate that issue again the following week and maybe the following week or maybe the following day, right? And so, you know, we've got now the ability to place network events in the hands and in the possession of the IT team, right? The moment it happens, uh, whether they choose to use it or not, um, the tools are there to do just that so that you do not have to go ask somebody to go try to recreate an issue, which we know is a major annoyance, right? When you start to talk about healthcare delivery environments. And so, you know, uh, we deployed uh, a few hospitals recently in the, in the state of Georgia, and within minutes of going live at one of the hospitals, another benefit that, that, we, that we saw was they found two uh, bad network cables that would have eventually uh, most likely resulted in a downtime in a closet and uh, if it wasn't caught. And so that that's power, powerful stuff as well too, right? When you start to look at this and being able to comb the network and to be able to get deep level of insight, again, around what is happening on that network to prevent stuff like possibly would have just, you know, would have, would have happened maybe in a, in a couple of weeks or maybe in a couple of months. And so in the other part to this was the, uh, was the location-based services. And we've talked about uh, that a little bit earlier, no, no physical beacons. Uh, we don't require any BLE site surveys. There's no need to hang the beacons, move the beacons, and maybe the, the most annoying element of all, change and replace the batteries, right? Uh, and that's oftentimes why people actually think of some of this stuff as being a massive headache. So if you have a, a VBLE strategy and things that can be tethered uh, to VBLE, uh, when, it, when you look at this, uh, it makes life much, much simpler, right? Yes, you might still have to mess with tags if some things physically don't have a Bluetooth enabler, but at the end of the day, you're cutting down on the massive amount of maintenance that's typically required in managing and, and uh, you know, operating these types of uh, systems. We also can locate, as I mentioned, within one to three meters, right, of proximity. And we've got sub-second latency. Uh, it's important in high RF and medical environments that have a lot of noisy air. So keep, keep that in the back of your mind as well. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Some additional cases, uh, use cases that we're seeing, right? So we've seen some proximity tracing use cases here and there. So understanding uh, a user's journey, uh, dispersing hot zones. So if uh, more than six people are in an area, how do you send a notification based on proximity to disperse that area? Uh, knowing who's possibly coming into contact with somebody, right? We saw some of this naturally with COVID. Uh, some organizations uh, have have gone down the path of, you know, obviously implementing these things, but I also say a lot of people have not, right, to be fair, uh, whether they choose to, to think that it might be too big brotherish, um, and, and I can teeter on both sides of the house there, but the, the, the platform can do this. That's the beautiful part. Look at also manufacturing floor and workflows. Look at um, you know the ability to to tether in building automation and getting temperature and refrigeration and, and a whole assortment of humidity right a whole assortment of data points that you know is important in healthcare type environments whether it's life si or life sciences or whether it happens to be related to an actual uh, hospital right hospital setting and so we're seeing a lot of this stuff uh, appearing right and. Again, it's the organization looking at what they can do as it relates to improving workflows based on what they're trying to achieve, right? And so if it's speed to market for the life science side or if it's healthcare delivery and workflow optimization for the providers, these are all different things that we're seeing. And so I'll, I'll go into the, the next slide here, uh, giving you a, a deeper level example. Uh, Bailey, if we could flip it real quick. 
uh, to the uh, uh, Via Health System. Okay, so a, a one of the largest uh, health systems that that uh, you know exists across the world, uh, let alone the U.S. The Orlando VA Medical Center is considered the innovation center of the uh, VA health system. This is the most recent brand new greenfield build out hospital within the VA system itself. Okay, so they built this massive facility, 1.2 million square feet. They built it. They made it beautiful. They wanted the veterans and the guests to have a, a wonderful experience in which they serve over 400,000 uh, annually. But what they found is they built this, and as everybody started coming, is people were missing appointments. And people, you know, whether they whether they don't show up at all or whether they were they were late, and they couldn't figure out, um, you know, what the problem was besides looking at it and saying, we've got a navigation issue here where we're not able to help our patients get from point A to point B and find their way around the facility because it is so large. And so the executive team took a step back and said, hey, we've got to fix this. And how can we serve up, you know, and, and really create a platform, if you will, to help the patients and guests uh, move around the facility and understand where they're going. And so leveraging uh, thousands of, of missed APs across visit hospitals and integrating uh, some of the tags now with, uh, with our, our, uh, you know, our uh, VBLE capabilities and also the IoT ports, and we'll talk about in just a second, they've now created a, a very unique platform that allows them to immediately engage with patients, with guests, with staff, uh, the moment somebody walks in uh, the door. We'll go to the next slide and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of those use cases. And so when you, when you start to step back and look at it, so greeting somebody right when they come in, offering them up the ability to pop in where they're looking to go, finding and knowing where that person is, again, based on VBLE services, and then helping navigate with a turn-by-turn, step-by-step directions to, to their uh, destination, okay? They also have the ability in this particular example, uh, they, they have a gift, or they've got a coffee shop, excuse me. And so as people walk by the coffee shop certain hours of the day, they can actually serve up a digital coupon like we talked a little bit about earlier. Um, something unique that they're doing, and you don't see a lot of this yet, is they have the ability to offer a concierge-like service, and we'll call it a special request. And so within a mobile app, the patient, the guest, as they walk in, if they need, let's say, a wheelchair uh, or they need oxygen, right? But let's say wheelchair because that's the most common one. And a wheelchair is not readily available and the triage uh, staff, right, may be busy or they may not even be at the desk. You can actually do a behind the scenes call through the mobile application for a wheelchair, knowing where you are. That staff that is watching and mining and, and uh, maintaining the system can then locate a wheelchair and bring that wheelchair to the front of the building, if, as you as you wish, right? As, as the staff or the, as the uh, the patient arrives, and deliver that wheelchair as an Uber-like experience. Meanwhile, as the person is locating, the staff is locating the wheelchair. The patient and the guest can actually look right and watch where the staff is and retrieving the wheelchair for them. So again, a very Uber-like experience. They are uh, managing, right, and and uh, monitoring some of the locations of assets. Uh, so vacuums, pumps, wheelchairs, uh, vents was a big deal during COVID for the for the VA. And so being able to look and watch and be able to track those down quickly makes a uh, makes a fundamental difference, right? When you start to look at uh, workflows, but then you start to look at waste or lost revenue because a lot of these things can unfortunately walk out the door too on top of it. And then last but not least, one of the things that they did here uh, specifically was they took the IoT port uh, capabilities that's in the access point and they integrated into Stanley electronic door locking system. So uh, PTSD is real, unfortunately, and uh, they have a specific wing at the VA uh, hospital at Lake Nona that uh, caters to and, and treats uh, particular patients that do have PTSD. And so they are at risk for flight, right? So they're a flight risk. Unfortunately, you have to protect them and you have to protect others. How can you keep a safety profile for not only the individual, but for others in the organization? Well, you can do so by again, tethering in the IoT port into Stanley for the door locking system so that if the patient happens to get within five, let's say 10 feet of the door, the doors will automatically lock or they will remain locked, right? Based on the posture. Now, if they're walking with a credentialed staff member, whether it be a social worker, whether it be a, uh, um, you know, a physician, and they need to go somewhere else within the facility to another appointment, maybe to the common area, 
um, you know, or to, let's say, uh, just uh, to go down to the cafeteria, right, to, to maybe walk and get some food. Um, you know, what happens is, is based on the credentials, that will do an override and you will be able to walk out or that staff member will be able to walk out with that particular patient just based on privilege alone. So uh, anyway, some really cool things that are, that are uh, hey, hey, you Matt? know. Yeah. Hey, hey, Matt, I just want to ask, Mitch, I just want to ask a quick question. Uh, are, are you uh, knowing, uh, seeing this, I mean, this all makes sense. I, I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's very compelling. My question is, does this mean typically that you're going that the engagement the the sales process involves more than just the VP of IT or the the head of IT? In other words, are you having uh, you know uh, uh, the VP of operations or even maybe the VP of marketing? Are they somehow involved in the decision making for these for uh, what you're seeing uh, for for basically location based services? Yeah, you're seeing you're seeing more interest and more um, responsibility, Mitch, as you pointed out, across different types of roles. So think chief experience officer, right? Chief digital officers, um, yeah. compliance, right? When you started to look at some of the safety uh, mechanisms, so absolutely, there is a uh, a bit of a sprawl, right? When you start to look at who can be targeted uh, on a selling motion, right? But also who's involved in perhaps the decision making. Uh, experience is important. It's very important for marketing too, right? They've got HCAP scores. There's a lot of things that the hospital is being measured on. And so uh, making sure again that, that people are part of it, um, you know, it, it may spawn out of a different department like clinical informatics, uh, like with the specimen collect collection uh, scenario, right? So that was something that we were talking uh, specifically to Memorial, Memorial Sloan Kettering about, and it was spawned out of the, the uh, informatics team. So mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, real, really good question because it is, you're starting to see a bit of a morphing, right, on ownership. Yep, yep cool. Thanks. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. And sorry, I got a typo on that slide. I, I should probably uh, fix that <laughs> up top. Ba Bailey, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, last but not least, I think this is the last slide. Um, I think it kind of speaks to itself, right? We're, we're, the, we're a new Juniper, um, just to be fair, right? We look fundamentally different than we looked 24 months ago. I can probably say that because I've been here three years. And uh, now that we have a very, very compelling uh, portfolio, which continues to expand uh, and, and continues to be deeply integrated and integrated quickly. And when we can bring things to market much faster and we can uh, you know, onboard these acquisitions and tether them into our portfolio and make major differences and help a lot of our, uh, you know, help a lot of our customers and our prospects, uh, you know, that's a very exciting position to be in. And so uh, one of the things that I'll, I'll point out here too, is that in 2021, most recently, uh, we did get a, a visionary again for the indoor location services. So we are the furthest to the right. And um, literally when you look at a, a holistic platform strategy, <clears throat> Quite, quite far ahead of the competitors from a networking perspective. We're even ahead of some RTLS companies if, if you look at the, uh, the VBLE indoor location services quadrant. Okay. But anyway, I'll, I'll kind of leave you with that slide here just to allow, allow it to speak for itself. Let's go to the next slide. I think, okay, that goes to yours. One thing I will tell everybody here, uh, there are some handouts. So those of you that are looking for some additional information about how uh, maybe Juniper can make a fundamental difference within some of these environments. Uh, we've got some info sheets, some solution briefs, some case studies that are in the handout section. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Bailey and just say, you know, thank you for your time. And I think we'll maybe take some questions here towards the end. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in here. I, I, thanks, Matt, That's, that, was, that was really, a, that was awesome. Um, not to use that word too often, but it, it really was uh, it's great stuff. And uh, uh, it, it, just for everyone, and, and I know I want to I want to get to the Q and A real quick here, but uh, we do have a few fast track sessions coming up, uh, May 6th, uh, Juniper Accelerate Plus program. We'll, we'll go deep on the uh, Accelerate Plus program, uh, and then we will have a uh, missed advanced analytics on May 20th. Uh, so you know, please. Uh, if you if you see those of interest, please sign up and, and attend those as well. Uh, I, I just want to add one 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 piece to uh, what uh, on, on Secure Maddox and, and Juniper, and that is that you know we are not just high touch, but we're highly focused. And that is you know we we represent and, and uh, sell Juniper Mist, uh, we sell uh, Ruckus, uh, Sonic Vol, and Pulse Secure. But certainly Juniper Mist is the uh, 
the lion's share of what we do. Our team is highly, highly focused on juniper mist. We're experts on it. We work with the juniper team on a daily basis, if not, you know, multiple times a day. Britt Keenan, who is the uh, is, is our uh, the partner manager, uh, manages our relationship. We're, we're on with her, um, you know, number of times a day, making sure we have the right inventory, making sure we're, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, making sure we're on the same page on, on the entire part of our, our, our business. Uh, Bailey works closely with Karen Wagner in marketing. Our SEs work at the hip with, you know, Juniper and, and uh, Securematic. So uh, I guess I just want you to know, you know, we certainly don't have the deep expertise as Matt Roberts, so it's wonderful to have Matt on. Uh, but you know, we, we want you to know that we, uh, you know, we, we certainly think we provide a, a, a very high level of service, you know, for Juniper. So um, anyway, with Mitch, all that said, Mitch, I'll, I'll echo that as well. Just my experience working with you guys has been nothing short of spectacular. Very customized, very white glove, um, and very specialized, right? In, in regards to just the delivery and taking care of our our partner community. So uh, everything you said is 100% accurate. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Yeah, we we definitely want to treat everyone. We want to give personalized service to to every one of our partners. So anyway, with that, let's go. Hopefully, you. Uh, you uh, Bailey, are there any anything queued up for questions or anybody have any questions they want to ask now? Um, we don't have any questions yet, but if anybody has some, please um, submit them to the chat or the question box. I mean, I, I'll just expand on the location-based services piece. And Matt, I guess I, I have some prior, in a prior life experience with you know, IoT and, and, and uh, location-based services, uh, and mainly in the retail space and hospitality. But um, without question, driving uh, a, uh, a, a driving uh, optimizing a customer experience, and whether it be a patient in healthcare, a patient experience, or clinician experience, or whatever. I mean, I just anecdotally, I dropped my son off at the at Kaiser here in San Diego yesterday. He had a little uh, small procedure. Uh, but the the experience was actually really really was great, and uh, I was um, I was pleasantly surprised. You know the communication and and dropping them off and picking them up and the, the, the logistics of it, the coordination of it was really great, and it goes a long way. And I mean obviously it's a competitive world, um, and so you know uh, these healthcare providers are fighting for dollars, and uh, I think that for them to provide a, a great um, experience, you know, throughout the entire you know, process, you know, as you highlighted, uh, Matt, I think is is uh, is uh, is going to be more and more important for these guys. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if I take my healthcare hat off, right? There's there's so many different industries in which um, you know we continue to make inroads in, and and I think that's the exciting part to this too, right? Is is as you look at consumerism and you look at as you know more and more things continue to. Um, be digitally enabled and and we as consumers you know continue to lean on mobile devices right and those aren't going away um, you know there's the ability to to engage right and so whether it's retail uh, whether it's hospitality right whether it's healthcare we're just seeing more and more of these types of conversations emerging the beautiful part here too right is that this is a journey i think everybody realizes that and so whether it's a, a crawl walk run or maybe maybe it's a slow jog whatever that is at least there's a platform in place today that is future proofed, right? And so it's not throwing a bunch of pieces and parts um, at you when you start to look at the architecture. Um, you can light the service up when you want, right? So you're not saying that you have to go light all this stuff up and have to have it active and pay for it when you're not utilizing it. That's the beautiful part to this, right? So think of it as a consumption model, so to speak. Uh, and so we realize some aren't there yet, right? A lot of a lot of people are still looking at location-based strategies. Uh, to be fair, and how can they drive a concerted, um, you know, uh, plan uh, to make sure that they're making best use of technology? Because mm -hmm. as you guys are are all aware, there's so much waste uh, in, in healthcare specifically. I mean, we've got one uh, very large hospital system that we're working with that uh, put beacons across all their hospitals and never turn them on and end up finding that they just ended up replacing batteries and batteries and batteries and, and you know they spent a couple million bucks in this technology and and now something better has come along right <laughs> so yep. that's, that's the reality and uh you know the cool part is is that we've got a lot of smart people you know we're, we're an engineering company 
Uh, we do a great job of, of bringing technology to market and really stepping back and listening uh, to what some of the pain points are and what the challenges are. And then, you know, learning and taking any outcomes that can be shared, right, publicly. And a lot of people are willing to now step up and get on the podium and say, this has made a major difference in our business or yeah. organization. And we want others to be able to learn from this as well. And so how can we be advocates, right, of helping better move processes, workflows, you know, all, all the fun stuff along to better, you know, in, in my world, to better treat patients, to better, you know, access uh, for information and to hopefully, right, be able to help at some point in time, allow our populations to manage our health more effectively, reducing readmissions and all the stuff that is just yep. a, you know, yep. just a, a plague on our system. So anyway. Uh, and I think I know I touched on this earlier, but uh, for the, uh, for the partner still on, we, we do have a, a, a POC program. Uh, so if you do have uh, customers who want to uh, try, uh, you know, try and buy or test or, or, or you know, basically do a proof of concept, obviously we can, uh, we can support that. Um, and so please reach out to uh, either our team or your Juniper uh, rep, uh, and we can, we can help facilitate that because we do understand that this is still new technology, and I think that you know, some, some, uh, you know, uh, end users are going to want to. Uh, uh, test it out first and, and, and make sure that the uh, it, it performs it performs the way that they're expected and, and, and provides the ROI as well. So um, Mitch, I think that's important real quick. One one note on that. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what our official statistics are, but the ones that I've been in at least eight or nine out of 10 times that somebody gets into a POC, they end up moving forward with the solution, right? It's that powerful. Once they start to see the visibility, they start to yeah. see the information that can be provided and gleaned out of the network that's when it becomes more real. And then the beauty part, right? When you start cutting down those support tickets <laughs> and then you can evolve, right? That's the good part. Yep. Uh, any questions, Bailey? Okay, so. No, I think Matt did such a great job. He answered them all already. <laughs> I know Matt's done such a great job. Guys, uh, we we, uh, we will follow up with, with a survey and, and a uh, link to the recording and uh, the documents, uh, again, that you've seen here. So. Really, thank you. Thanks, thanks for your attendance. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at a, a future fast track. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. We appreciate thanks. it. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone.